Welcome to episode 22 of Shane Talks. Uh, this one is called From Guam to Gemini, and that title will make sense as long as you keep listening to what we're about to talk about. Um, this episode is all about the uh, the movies that Jason and I have made together. Uh, it, it worked out that uh, episode 22, we could use the Gemini Films logo, which is the Roman numeral 2 already. So that all kind of worked out uh, for the marketing purposes of this episode. Uh, the first thing I actually want to say, uh, well, as you can see, this is a second episode in a row that we are in the same building, socially distanced from each other. Uh, we are in a movie theater. Um, and the thing that I absolutely love about this, man, I can't, I can't lie, sitting down here with you like this, Takes me back to the Siskel and Ebert days, man. Oh, totally. That's... Gro growing up, like two guys sitting in a movie theater talking about movies, like that's exactly what this feels like to me. I can totally see why you would say that. So it just makes me happy. It's kind of like my childhood coming full circle with us in a movie theater. I'm about to talk about our movies. Yeah. Uh, for the people who don't know, uh, between 2000 and 2006, Jason and I were involved in a total of 19 different film projects in the state of Indiana. Uh, we were, we ran one of the four biggest production companies that was going on in the state of Indiana in and, the in the independent market, and one of the very first that went went with digital film and correct like did that kind of stuff because there might have been other ones that were doing film, but yeah, we were yeah. one of the first. There, there were a couple of professional uh, people in town that were doing filmmaking stuff, but as far as independent cinema went, it was us. Uh, Bunk Films, Penguin Productions, and uh, the Film Commune were yep. basically the four biggest ones. We put out the most products on a consistent basis. Um, Penguin hit like a super high, had a couple of movies in a row, and then kind of just died off. I believe uh, the guy that was in charge of Penguin moved out to the West Coast, and that just kind of killed yeah. them here in Indiana. Probably tried to go and do something with film. Uh, well, I think he moved up to like Pacific Northwest, if I remember uh, right. Um yeah. But, I mean, you know, it was 20 years ago, so I'm not entirely sure that's correct. Um, Bunk Films, I know Tino and I, we got along for the most part, and then he just kind of stopped making films as far as I could tell. Um, near the end of what I call the big four of us, near the end of our span around 2005 or whatnot, there was a couple of other companies that had started taking out. Uh, Chris Allen and Raxo Productions were doing some huge projects here in yeah, town. Like, uh, what was that, Star Trek versus... Uh, Batman? Star Trek versus Batman was one of the big ones that they did. Yeah. Which, um, if you haven't, if you enjoyed Batman, the original television series, and Star Trek, the original series, uh, I we heavily recommend going online. I believe it's still I on YouTube, or at least it used to be. Uh, it, look it up. Star Trek versus Batman. It's very funny. Very and, campy, very cheesy, like you said, in the style of the 60s Batman. Yeah, and, and one of our friends and one of the guys that we've worked with, Josh, um, oh my, Ramsey. Ramsey. Joshua yep. Ramsey was uh, Captain Kirk, and he's hilarious as Captain Kirk. Yes, he is. So take your time. If, you've got, if you're watching us and you've got any extra time. Feel free to head over there and watch that. It's it's worth your it's worth your watching time for sure. Uh, and then the project that I don't think he ever actually they filmed a trailer for it, but I don't believe they ever actually made it. Was he was doing a Quantum Leap movie that was called A Leap to Die For, where Sam Beckett was, uh, I believe he was either jumping into Princess Di's body or jumping into like her bodyguard's body. I can't remember. Yeah, and it was trying to save and her trying life. to save her life. Yeah, uh, I also remember that at one point in time, I think it's the same production company was trying to do a Batman movie, like they a Dark Knight yep. kind of movie. Yep, that was or Chris. Maybe right, it was right after Batman Begins, I think. Yeah. Um, because Chris that, Spurgeon was a part of that one. That would have been in like 2008 uh, or nine ish Yeah. Because um, I, I had a couple of my friends that were looking to get into acting that I sent Chris's way to do auditions and whatnot. Um, so, yeah. Which I think Chris Spurgeon would have been perfect as uh, the the Indianapolis independent version of Christian Bale. He, he I can see that. Uh, the way he looked, especially um, at the time, was would have worked out really well. Yeah. Um, so we are here in a movie theater. We got ourselves some nice uh, caramel popcorn in a Star Wars bucket. Uh, we got our gummy snacks to chew on while we're here. Uh, and we are going to be discussing the 19 projects we've worked on. Some of them we're going to skim over because... Some of them don't really matter to talk about. Um, 
but we'll at least mention the projects that we did and who we worked with on them and whatnot. Uh, the most people who do know that Jason and I made movies know that we made a horror film called Consternate. However, before we filmed Consternate, we actually had two short films that we made uh, just to try to learn how to use the camera and and have fun with our friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and What's the first one that we did? First one we did was the mobster movie. Yes. If you ever want to see Shane do a horrible accent that do you're not four, even sure. Four horrible accents. My you, accent changes every scene. You're not even sure where his accent's from. Nope. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he does uh, some some fun accents. Um, uh, Lee Vidal played a mobster boss. Uh, Mark Buckwalter and Justin Browning play uh, <laughs> the bodyguards enforcers whatever you want to call them side, yeah like of uh, the mob boss uh ryan van vels plays the sidekick to shane's whatever whatever character. i am the uh, plot of why i'm in this movie completely changes like at oh, one yeah, point totally. i'm stealing microfilm at one point it's about some money the at one numbers, point at like, number like uh, yeah well and you know the whole thing started off with us knocking off of pulp fiction yep uh, one of no, uh, Pulp Fiction's most iconic sequences. So, uh, if you have the time, that one's on YouTube, Gemini Films. Uh, it's it's silly. It's funny. It's like twenty minutes long, maybe yeah, about twenty, I think. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's very silly, very funny. We did it. We did all the editing linear mm -hmm. while we like so literally we were making the movie and then editing it technically while we were filming it. And so we were like rewinding and going over certain spots and stuff like that. Uh, Shane went in and cleaned it up around the 10 year mark, I think it was. Maybe it was yeah. like six year mark. Somewhere. It's Five somewhere or six years? There. Yeah. But yeah, so Shane went in and cleaned it up a little bit. Cleaned up some of the jump cuts that got left in there, yeah, uh, and adding credits at the added beginning credits and end. So that Tried to make it a little bit more professional than what it originally <laughs> was which was literally a movie shot in one day or two it days was one day, one day. It, was, it was the total of like four hours yeah i think maybe 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 not even that long yeah uh, so what was our second one our Shane? second one was the x-men musical oh gosh. you heard that right the x-men musical oh, so, so this bad. was 2000 this was right before the x-men like the first x-men movie was coming out because we did it in, like, March or April. So oh, it was yeah, a month yeah, or yeah. two. This is just a few months before. Yeah. This is, like, a month or two before the, like, the X-Men craze. July, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. It was July. You're right. So. Uh, so, yeah, a couple of months before the real one came out, we were at our friend Mark's house, the same place that the Mobster movie was filmed. We had our camera. We were messing around with some more stuff. And we thought, let's do a stop-motion video. Not, not really stop motion, though, because no. we had all of Mark's X-Men action figures. And we hold them. And, and we move you them. see their hands, and you see, you see them get moved. And we do bad singing. And it, it's basically bad karaoke to songs. That you know and love. That you know, but they changed. The, I didn't do any of the singing because I can't sing at all. But the other guys <laughs> that could sing, I was just the camera operator on this. The guys who could sing took songs like Ba With A Ba by Kid Rock and rewrote the lyrics to whatever character they had in their oh, hand. It's a it's a hoot. Guess what? That one's on YouTube too. <laughs> so if you want to take the time to watch a 20 minute ridiculous video that should have been sent in the year 2000, should have been sent to the Wizard World Chicago uh, fan film Fan film stuff? Festival. That would have been hilarious. That would have, just because of how ridiculous it is. Uh, I think a lot of people would have enjoyed watching that. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you have the time, watch that one. Why not? Let's get some views on our on our. I'm, I'm pretty channel. sure a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today is on there, so we can try to try absolutely out some views. Um, this year is the 20th anniversary of uh, what what eventually became Gemini Films. I guess we haven't really addressed that yet. These first two, three things that we're talking about were all done under a banner called Guam Guys. G W A M Guys. Guam has um, been interpreted as a gay white American males, uh, but that's not what it means. But and we joke about it. It's funny. It, we don't mind. Um, Guam was because Jason and I first started getting creative together in high school in our uh, typing class, and Guam stood for General Words a Minute. It was you just said that was creative. I mean, Mrs. South should have flunked both of well, us. Well, you're right. Um, but we were creative together in that class. In, in it's where our friendship really started getting like some deep roots. I'll there put we it go. That way. I mean, because we, we've we known each other since eighth grade. Yes. 
So um, that's but where yeah. we actually started actually hanging out and being friends. Talking about movies, like starting to realize that we had that in common and whatnot. Um, but so anyway, so the, those, those two productions and then our third one, uh, which is the horror film we're about to talk about, this year, 2020, is the 20th anniversary of us releasing the film Consternate our first feature length film that was born well so over the uh, back in September we released a video um, on the Gemini Films YouTube channel and I can't remember if I linked to it from the Shane Talks page or not um, I would imagine you did I think I did you had the banner and everything yeah you can you can go over to our Gemini Films page and you can uh, watch a two hour conversation between Jason and I and five of our cast members the 20 year reunion it's a, uh, Zoom. Yeah, 20 year reunion Zoom call that we did together uh, with uh, the other lead actress. Um, and a bunch of other people. And a bunch of other people. Uh, so we got all them together. We talked about the movie. We talked about making the movie and what people remember from that. It was our, it was our 20 year anniversary. And um, that was the last production that was under the, gem, or under the Guam banner. But all of our stuff that we do for it now we kind of either put both logos on or we kind of just leave it as the Gemini films now. Yeah, and I mean, uh, side note, we're really sad because uh, with COVID, it's not only thrown everybody's lives in turmoil and there's no question that there are things worse than what I'm about to mention for people, uh, but uh, we had the okay to show Consternate in a movie theater setting um, from uh, the company that Shane and I work for uh, to take over uh, showing for one evening so that we could show it to our friends and family. And due to COVID, um, we've kind of let that fall aside. Yeah. Hopefully, if things work out well, maybe we're silly enough to do, a, hey, our movie's old enough to drink next year. Oh, that's a good um, idea. I like that. But uh, so, like, we do want to... Th this was a monumental achievement as far oh, as things sure. went for us especially being 19 20 year old kids and not having any money mm -hmm. and um just f spending a lot of time with our friends and family and uh putting together something that i'm proud of still to this day oh yeah um i can't wait to show my kids even <laughs> though i have to wait like another at least <laughs> probably like four five or six years before i can show my two oldest boys <laughs> um uh but yeah like it's something that i absolutely love it's something that's fun to watch and um yeah just uh as far as everything we ever made we did make you know like he said 19 things and out of those 19 things it's probably the thing i'm most proud of is consternate and i only say that from the simple fact that it's just we had no idea what we were doing and we were pushing through it and we kept, we we lost stuff. We, oh yeah. We, I mean, things went bad. Uh, we had to, there was a lot of uh, <laughs> essentially team building uh, and, uh, and fights and arguments and quitting and all sorts of stuff. And so uh, if you're interested in any of that stuff, go watch the 20 year reunion. It's like, it'll get a lot more in depth than that. Yeah, um, we, we go pretty deep into the stories about everything, everything that happened during the production, the people that quit, how we, the ones we were able to get back, the. Hey, and you know what? The good news is, is Consternate is also on our YouTube <laughs> channel. So if you want to watch it, feel free. You can watch Consternate and you can watch the 20 year reunion after you watch right it. Right on, Shane. Um, and as you were saying on that, we go into a lot more detail about the origin of Consternate, but I'll try and make it quick here. Um, in April of 1999, Jason and I were in a group of about nine guys that wanted to make a movie. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many cooks in the kitchen. It went south really quickly. Uh, in September of 1999, Jason uh, asked me if I was interested in just doing one, the two of us together. Uh, that day was the birth of Consternate. We started writing it. And one year and three months later, we showed it to a full sold out auditorium of 200 people. It wasn't sold out. I mean, that theater held like 240. So All right, like... so close to sold out. I think we had about 200 people there. Though. We had, like, we, it was like, like 180 or 190. Yeah, it was yeah. close. So, we were able to accomplish that in a, in, in a, in a month or a year and three months uh, from writing. We wrote from 
uh, September of 1999. I think I finished the final draft in February of 2000, right when we started casting. And I want to say in February, January or February is when uh, we got the... the um the camera. The camera, yeah. Yep. And so we started shooting and messing around because we wanted to know how to use it properly. And that resulted in those first two projects that are hilarious to watch. Oh, so funny. Uh, so then comes um, a horror movie because I'm a huge horror movie fan. Jason likes horror movies. I was obsessed with Scream, like obsessed to another level. That's uh, true. And I did love Halloween also. I was there. <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street, like all of the all of the slasher flicks of the eighties and, and late seventies and whatnot, I really I really got into because of Scream. I had seen Halloween and I liked Halloween, but Scream was the movie that like pushed me into I wanna make a horror movie or I, I love horror movies. So a lot of our movie really just started off with how can we rip off Scream? How can we how can we make a movie about teenagers in high school? And somebody's going around slashing and killing them. But. But. Unlike Scream, we had people who were just out of high school. <laughs> you know, compared to, like, all these people who are in their mid-20s or late-20s sure. playing 18-year-olds. Uh, so, we, we got to make ourselves a horror movie for our first feature-length film that we did, and that was an absolute blast. Oh, yeah. We, oh, I'd love to do... I'd seriously... Either love to do Consternate 2 or do another horror movie sure. at some point. Because I think knowing what we know now and knowing tricks of the trade and stuff, I think Having access a lot more. to better equipment. Like, I mean, we didn't buy the absolute best camera. We bought the camera that we could afford that was still a digital 8 camera. Yep. But it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a high-end mini DV or anything at that point because those were way out of our price range. Oh, yeah. Um, so we bought the camera that we can afford, and, and we made a fairly good film. A couple of years later, we were able to get into a GL2 and and make some higher quality stuff. But uh, anything else you want to say about Consternate? It's awesome. If you haven't it seen is. it, watch it. Uh, feel free to make fun of it and laugh at us. Feel free to laugh at my shiny shirt that I wear throughout the movie Consternate that uh, I... He still tries to wear. I still wear to this day. Tries to wear. It, I, I know it's just mm, it looks so good it's, it's definitely beautiful. 90s for you <laughs> um, after we did consternate um, I made a short film that you starred in it was a three minute film uh, you and Tony Linter and we utilized the PSO works bar that we knew very well what's that look no again again your short buddy yeah, again, it's the short where time rewinds and you're at the bar and you catch the glass when it falls. Oh, does that happen too? Yeah. I just remember the beginning when we were sitting. We when were, you're down at the canal. And down you at the canal. And did it re- this, this okay, spin okay. shot I'm around sorry. I totally forgot what works is in that yeah. movie. Uh, it's, it's a three-minute short, so there's a lot to forget, apparently. <laughs> it, and I was in it! <laughs> yeah, it, it, it starts... It starts Oh, with wow. the shot that that does the 720 degree shot around you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Dave Lichty being in the uh, wheelchair and yep. us shooting it, or going around and around. Starts and then, off of your feet, does a 720 around you to come up to you while you're on the phone, and then in the distance when the 720 stops, you see Tony walking at you on his phone. You guys get off the phone and shake hands. And the funny part is that Shane never told us what to wear. <laughs> So Tony and I showed up to film on the day of filming in the exact same outfit by accident. Which was hilarious. Dress a pants blue and a button down. Button down shirt and khakis. Mm-hmm. And we both did it and it was and it <laughs> yeah. I mean, luckily the film's in black and white. Until the end. Until the end. But then I remembered that part. But then uh the other thing about it is Because your character can manipulate time, you dressed exactly like Tony. Yeah, see, I can retcon stuff. No, no. This is not Star Wars. (laughs) We do not retcon. So anyway, so it starts off with you and Tony meeting up. Then you guys go eat at P.S. O'Rourke's. Brandy, the waitress, drops the glass and you catch catch it it before it falls. I remember that. And then, and Tony's got his, like, bewildered look on his face. How did you catch that? Uh, And then... You guys go out and you're walk- we're back walking the canal again, and you see Zach run into the elevator 
where my ex-wife was in the elevator and you see Zach run into the elevator with her. a knife to kill her. And that's when the, the, the twist is revealed that you can rewind time. So when you see Zach run in there, you catch a glimpse of the knife in his hand. So you rewind time, um, uh, 30 seconds or whatever, and we'll then you running. tell Tony to run. So you guys run into the elevator with my ex-wife before Zach goes in there. And then there's the weird standoff where you're standing and staring Zach down and he's getting all sheepish. Yeah. That was that it took oh. me ten minutes to explain a three minute short film. <laughs> it did. It, now uh, you don't need to watch it. Yeah, you really do. It might be on our YouTube channel, but don't bother. <laughs> Shane just told you the whole thing. Um, but that was something that I did for the very first Project Greenlight. That was uh, the Matt Damon Ben Affleck show. Because Shane's obsessed with Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. I'm obsessed with Ben Affleck. Matt Damon's just okay. But anyway, I wanted I it was a it was a directing competition. Of I course know. I wanted to be I know. I remember. In that. Or actually, this was season two. I apologize. Season one. Oh, yeah, because that kind of snuck up on us. Season one snuck up on us. Yeah, season one. No, season one, I still submitted my script uh, for All Good Things. Oh, that's right. The script that I wrote after Consternate. Yep. Um, I submitted my script for that and did not end up getting to the later rounds. And then this was the short that I did for season two, because season two, they broke it up where you could either submit a three-minute short film to be uh, considered as a director, or you could submit a script to be considered a writer. A, a writer for the season two Do movie. you remember who won season two? Was that Battle of Shaker Heights? That was Battle of Shaker Heights, yeah. Good movie. Oh, fucking amazing movie. Oh, so, so yeah, good. Yeah, one of uh, 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 Shia LaBeouf's first films. And, and Amy Smart's in it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, like, it's so good. Uh, uh, Kevin Pollack, I believe, is yep. it. Yep, yep. Uh, it it ha it ended up getting a really good cast, and it's 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 also fun watching that season of, of Project Green because they had a lot of trouble on that production. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the director and the, the dad, writer didn't get along. The director and the writer weren't getting along, but the dad like canceled on them like forty eight hours before he was supposed to show up to start filming, so they had to like rush to find. Uh, I think it was Aiden Quinn that ended up coming in and being the dad. Oh yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, the guy from Benny and June. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so just watching season two is also very exciting, and I think they're all on HBO Max. I think I, I looked and saw them all on there. And we have entirely too much information in our heads about making movies. <laughs> um, uh, the fifth thing that we did is one that I don't necessarily. I mean, I, I, I count it because we did it, but it was literally done in one day. Did you do this for a, a class? Uh, I see. I can't remember if I actually did it for the, the. There's a couple later that I know were for a class. I thought you did this one for a class. This too. may have been. This was a a forced perspective shot that I did. Which here's the crazy thing. I unfortunately, like I always thought, this was a kind of original idea that I had. Um, I, I I went down the rabbit hole of '90s music videos the other day and realized that it's almost the exact same concept as the "Bye Bye Bye" video from NSYNC. <laughs> So what this what this was was it was a close up on a television, and you saw two marionettes where you could just see two people with strings coming off of their arms, and they were kind of having a scene interacting with each other. Well, you watch like a minute or two of that, and then the camera starts panning back, and you realize that it's it's a television that's hollowed out, but the 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 two actors that are doing stuff on the strings are way far away. And then my father was standing next to the television with actual marionette things that were attached to the top of the television to make it look like the strings were lining up to make it look like he was controlling them. And then like when he set the things down, uh, my brother and one of his friends just kind of like died in place. Uh, and then my dad walked away. And so it was like a, it was a forced perspective shot thing but then like I said I was watching that NSYNC video and it's literally like the girlfriend in that video is like holding the the marionette things while they're marionettes inside of an empty television and yep, I was yep. like huh I guess I didn't really come up with this idea not that I watched a lot of NSYNC videos uh, the truth is coming out now folks. no so that was a that was a short I did I think it was like two or three minutes long um, the next thing was a project that I don't even know how much you were involved with it. Uh, in 2002, we you did the Chrome Lady. Yeah. Uh, I was not involved okay. with this movie at all. I think I showed up to one of your filming, uh, one of the nights of filming. Got you. I want to say it was one of the first nights, um, and I just came to like check it out and say hi or whatever. Right on. Uh, at that point in time, I was stupidly. 
uh, yeah, I think that was while I was still stupidly involved with somebody. Yes. And so that that person ended up. I gave all of my time and effort to that person. So you would you would you would kind of fell off the phrase fell off of the, the that and and so I mean I guess that's a good point to bring up now. That's that another reason why Je- Zach kind of stepped up. And exactly what I was we went about from to say. Guam guys to Gemini Films was because. So well, and actually, uh, another thing that wasn't addressed between the middle of this, there's nothing in 2001 because I was living in California. Yeah. Showing consternate to a bunch of people, um, thinking that that was going to open doors. And some, who are in major players nowadays in uh, in Hollywood. And that is that is absolutely true. I made some really good friends while I was out in California. One of them being um, a gentleman named Brett Pollock, who has been doing director of photography work on some pretty major motion holly- major. Hollywood motion pictures. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Total uh, twist. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I, you know, 20 years ago, I showed the movie to Brett while I was out there. Um, I got, made, made some friends that are still lifetime friends today that I absolutely love talking to. But that's why we had nothing going on in 2001. By the time I came back from California, uh, you were hardcore into your relationship. And because I had been gone, you really had no interest in doing filmmaking stuff. I was still bitten by the bug, so Zach and I started spending a lot of time together and coming up with ideas for stuff. Uh, Zach had just bought a like top of the line Mac at that point uh, because he at, around That's that a time, Macintosh computer for some of you folks oh. that don't know what a Mac <laughs> is. Uh, he didn't buy a pimp. No, uh, so he had bought his Mac because he was starting to get the interest in doing film stuff or editing or stuff like that. Uh, so we took our camera that you and I had bought and Zach's computer and Zach and I messed around with a couple of things. And then because of the, I quote unquote, success of Consternate, uh, it, uh, it had started getting around that we had, you know, successfully made and shown a motion picture. A friend of a friend came to us, came to Zach and I and said, you know, I've got this script that I want to make into a movie and I've, I'm told that you can make actual movies happen. So Zach and I took that project. It was called The Chrome Lady. Uh, it was for our friend Ryan Tungate. Um, that's unfortunately, like, we well, while we did finish a version of the movie, uh, Zach cut it together as part of a capstone project for his, uh, for his degree at IU. Um, he used, he used his editing of that project as, like, you know, here's my skills as, as an editor and whatnot. Unfortunately, because of the time constraints of getting it turned in for college, he didn't get 100% approval from the director before he turned it in. Oh, I never heard that story. Yeah, I mean, and not that, not that it's like a bad blood type situation, but Zach finished it, the editor's cut, we can call it. <laughs> um, and then that's the one that we ended up showing when we did our big... Uh, Gemini Films Day at IUPUI, we showed Zach's version, but it was it, it was because Zach and Stace had never made the time, or Zach and Ryan had never made the time to get together to actually finish it the way he wanted it done, and since that didn't happen before our event that had a schedule like we're showing it on this day, <laughs> we had to show Zach's cut of the movie. I had no clue. Oh yeah, no clue. We had to show Zach's cut of the movie because it was done. It had mu- it had a soundtrack to it. It was yeah. it was a, a showable film. But I don't even think Ryan showed up that day. Be- uh, no, he did. He I'm did. sorry, he, he did. did. He did. But I I think he was late. Um, and I th- he only came to the afternoon though. He didn't come to the evening. Oh, that's right. That's what it was. So we we show he had the we, he had the talk. Uh, we we, we did showed it. Cute. We showed uh, we had a an, an a triple afternoon day. an afternoon and evening with, with Gemini, Gemini films. films. We did, uh, the first movie we showed was... We did uh, Escape, Escape, Chrome, Chrome Lady, Lady and, and, and To Change the World. To Change the World. Oh, wait, or was it Reunion? I'm wrong, it's a, it wasn't Escape. It oh, was no, The Chrome right. Lady, To Change the, the World, world and, and Reunion, reunion which yep. we will get to all those movies. But yeah, so uh, yeah, Stace showed up, to, or Ryan, uh, we used to call him Stace, uh, so you'll forgive me and Shane for constantly yeah. switching those. Um, but yeah, he showed up for the afternoon and did like a Q and A at the end of that for us. That's right. And then uh, did and not stay for the evening shows. And, uh, yeah, I don't think he stayed for the evening shows. And I want to maybe I did hear that story, but I want to say I didn't hear that story until we were in the Q and A. 
Yeah, I think so. if I if I and I think that's how you found out. If my too. memory serves correct, I I, I think I heard that he wasn't happy of, that we were showing Zach's cut, but he made it very clear during the Q and A that that was not his version of the movie, that he was not happy with certain things, and instead of answering a lot of questions, I feel like he spent his whole time explaining what should have been different in it. Oh yeah, but it is what it is. It is what it is. It's, younger, it's his movie, it's and he was you know, again I I. It's not like this date came out of nowhere. He had months notice that we were going to be showing these three movies on that day. And this was like two years after it was filmed. Like, there was time for it to get done differently. Um, This is unfortunately one of the projects that I don't seem to have a copy of anymore. I don't have Zach's version. I don't... I I was told Stace went out and re-edited it his way, but I've never seen that version of it. I want to say that you are correct that he did get it. He changed it up the way he wanted it to change up. And he put a different track uh, because we use temp tracks for Zach to get his project done. Um, So I want to say that he put original music on it instead of the temp tracks that uh, our friend Dave Lichty helped put on that for Zach. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to say I have a copy of it. Mm, I think on mini TV. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, It is something that that I'm trying to work on and figure out how to get uh, a copy of. Yeah, I'd love to get a copy of that, uh, whichever version it is or whatnot. Uh, And, I mean, someday I should reach out to Ryan and and ask him if I can see his version of it. That'd be cool. I I believe, because he ended up moving to California eventually also. He he went to college, went, went back to college, you know, later in life. To try to do editing and, and whatnot. What's that? Film school. Film yeah, school. to try to yeah. go to film school, yeah. Um, and I know I heard that redoing the edit of The Chrome Lady was part of one of his projects that he did in college. So I would someday like to be able to see it. I mean, I, who knows if I'm even still credited as a producer on it at that point. Like, our Gemini Films cut, which I'll call Zach's cut for now, like, obviously I'm credited on there, but. I wonder if that's why I've never heard from Stace is if he just decided to remove all of us from from any type of credit on the project. You guys were way more involved than I was. Yeah, so it is what it is. Uh, but that was that was one of the, the first movies that we put the, the Gemini Films tag on was the Chrome Lady. That we never that we never even I think it's the only movie that we had nothing involved with writing it or directing it. I think you're right. That is one that was brought to us, and and I just produced it as a producer. Yeah. I mean, I I, I got the cast for him, and I you know I put everything together yeah, for Zach him. Zach filmed it, and, and Zach shot it for him, and and he you know he directed. We got Jason Rich- Jason Richardson's phenomenal in the movie. Um, Michael Shelton. Michael Shelton was in it, and he was amazing. So yeah, like it had a it had an amazing cast. Um, it looks beautiful. Uh, a lot of the stills that I do still have that that I ripped from the movie, like. It, it it it's a it's a Maltese Falcon type film noir black and white black and white um, the the mood and the tone uh, the script is the script perfectly conveys the mood and the tone that they ended up putting on on camera uh, lots of voiceover work um, we used the PSO Works bar again for that one did a couple of nights of filming there um, it's one of the few times that we have the old bar from PSO Rourke's actually on film. When the bar was the straight bar along the yeah, back I mean, wall. you also have that in Escape. Um, I don't think so. I think by the time Escape no, came no. out, it was... No, Escape, it's, it's, it's definitely still that back the straight bar. bar. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I know I, it isn't again, but it's just it's not in there the for the world very long. it was, too. Oh, well, okay. So, Interesting. I didn't realize it was... Yeah. Uh, I, thought, I thought they changed it from... The wall bar to the square bar, fairly early. I want to say it was right after to change the world that they did that. I want to say it was in two thousand three, like the end of two thousand three, beginning of oh four, that they built the bigger bar. Bigger bar. Uh, But the one that you're talking, at least I'm pretty sure to change the world was also that way. Because I don't know if we ever showed that side of the building. I don't even remember us going to a bar and just. Oh yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll get there in a second. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, after the Chrome Lady, the first true Gemini Films in-house Gemini Film production um, was me trying to recreate Lost Highway. Which I don't watch David Lynch films very often and don't care for them very often when I do see them. So, uh, yeah, 
This was Shane being David Lynch. Very, very much me wanting to be David Lynch. Very much me wanting to make a, a, a circular film. Um, very much me trying to do bizarre storytelling. Um, weird stuff happening to a guy. Um, I got to play two different characters in it. I played a homeless bum uh, who also turns out to be a villain at the end. Um, same character but different appearance. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I was supposed to be Joshua Ramsey. Joshua Ramsey was supposed to be the character that I ended up playing, but uh, I can't remember why he ended up backing out or what happened there. But, uh, yeah, Shane came to me and was like, dude, I, you had already had production uh-huh. already put together. Yeah. Filming dates and everything, and then you were like, can you please help me out? I really can't remember what happened with Josh at that point. And I was sitting there trying to memorize the script literally while driving places <laughs> so that when I got on set, I would have as much of it in my brain as possible. Um, were you still in your relationship at that no, point? No. No, you, that, that was, was over. over? Okay, cool. That was like, it, like, that was like right after that was over. Okay. So, you know, I lost a bunch of weight because that's what you do when you get depressed. And, um, and, uh... I looked pretty damn good in that. I think you looked movie. really good in that movie, man. Although um, I was wearing clothes that were way too big for me. Because I, I'll agree with you I on that. I didn't you, buy new clothes yet. Right. Uh, but it, you you were supposed to be like a frumpy, dumpy, bad, like, not bad, gray area detective. Like, you, yeah, at 21 years old, I'm supposed to be playing No, I'm saying your detective. character. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, your character. You played old well. Uh, but oh, thanks. wearing the wearing the larger clothing, it's I my think hair. I think wearing the larger clothing really really helped out. Okay. So the the plot of Escape is basically a a, a detective. Oh, you don't need to be like that, man. <laughs> I think you're. I was just saying you're whacking me off. Oh uh, well, all. you know. Anyway, so you you played a detective who had done a bunch of shady stuff, and went to jail. Went to jail and. You were kind of disgraced, but then, like, these other guys that you used to run with are trying to get you to do stuff again, Tony's character, um, and then you owed money to Jay Jones. Um, had to work with O'Rourke. Yeah, you had, to, you had to pay off your debt to him by doing stuff for the bar owner. And, yeah, it was just... It was... And then... Annette and another girl named Sarah played the same character, but you were having trouble figuring out which one of them was reality and which one you were imagining, because every scene that we shot, we shot with both of them, or like we had photographs in the movie, but we had both of the girls shoot the exact same photograph, so that like you'd be holding it and then like you'd blink and it all of a sudden be the other girl, so it was kind of like you're losing your grip on reality and you don't know, you know, which one of them is real. I can't remember if one of, I, I don't remember if she was supposed to be like your ex-wife or ex-girlfriend or something. That's a good question. I, I Writer, can't remember. Writer, director, <laughs> producer. I can't remember, man. It's been a long time since I've seen it. So. But, yeah, yeah so. That one. On YouTube. Is on YouTube. <laughs> it's going to be the running goat gag for the night. It is. Uh, the next two were filmed over two summers. Uh, they're called Psycho in the Woods and Psycho in the Woods 2. Oh, they're re- they're hilariously bad. They're hilariously bad. You were only involved in one of them. Yeah, the second yeah, yeah. one. The second one I was supposed to be there but couldn't get the time off work. Yeah, so it it, it essentially oh, is... Oh. I scratch think, that. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I know why I wasn't involved in the second one. I wasn't invited the second time. Yeah. But anyway, so uh, to keep it as short as possible... <laughs> Uh, Too late. It's it's a it's a bunch of girls out in the middle of the woods. We we filmed them. Zach and I annually took a camping trip every summer together. As life became life, we had significant others. My ex wife is in this move is in both of those. Uh, Zach's current wife. All of their group of friends are in these. It's a bunch of girls that are out at a camping trip. They stumble across a cabin that has a bunch of satanic and demonic writing all over it. Uh, they find a book and they. It, essentially the evil dead they read from this book and all of a sudden like zombies start chasing them throughout this movie except zach zach's not a zombie in the first one he's just a serial killer in the first one oh maybe you're just thinking of the second one yeah i guess that is the second one i don't yeah i don't know they were they were shot just being silly goop they're silent films they were shot in like night vision and sepia and like weird color tones and stuff just to just to be weird um they're 
they're not really anything we actually consider in our body of work, but they were things that we did. They were, oh, they were edited to have openings and credits. So they're technically projects that we did. They were about 10 minutes each. Um, in 2003... I'm not sure why this is even on our list. Well, because Zach did do it for... We put my school projects on here. So oh, good point. since Zach did it as a school project... Well, and this is, you know, counted or not, but Zach was Zach had a school project to take a scene from a movie and uh, replicate it, to shoot it shot for shot the exact same, same dialogue um, and stuff like that. So Zach chose to do the final scene from Rounders um, where I did not play Matt Damon. The final scene with John Malkovich in Rounders. The final scene is when they're in Atlantic City playing. Oh, playing okay, poker. okay, all right. The, fi- the, the final confrontation between Malkovich and Matt Damon. There we go. Uh, he chose to redo that scene. I played John Malkovich with another terrible accent, <laughs> really bad accent. Um, I can't even remember the guy that I shot this Ooh, with. I don't. I don't I, know who that was. Yeah, when we this is also on our YouTube channel. We recently uploaded it because I found a copy of it. Uh, but I don't know the gentleman's name that I'm acting with in this one, so uh, not sure who to give credit to on that. Zach directed it. Everybody gives a shit about it because uh, we shot it around Christmas time, and Zach bought Oreos that have red filling in them instead of white filling. <laughs> and so everybody that I know that has watched this, that has commented to me about it, has been like, you don't have white filling in your Oreo. <laughs> but whatever. So, um, so my question is... Yeah. Is Brighten My Day the one where we did, I played a detective or something? No, that is like, the oh, Night Stalker. Oh, that's right. Okay, you're right, you're right. We're getting to that one. Brighten My Day was literally a one-minute short project that, um, it, it dealt with you and my ex-wife making eye contact at PS O'Rourke's. And then it cut to a rose in a vase, and it changed it from black and white to color. I don't remember that, but I'll believe you. Yeah, it's it's dumb. It doesn't really need to be. It, it, that, <laughs> we've already talked longer than the film is. It's literally like a one minute thing. I can't remember why I had to make it. Uh, it was another school project. Probably, that but I don't sense. remember what what it was for. Like I don't remember because it, it was literally a minute long. So we're gonna skip past that now. We're done with that. Yeah. The next two are some of my favorite things ever because they are just so. They're so awesome yep. because of the fact that I can say that I've done it. Uh, my kids love it uh, <laughs> because of the fact that they can see me uh, doing what I do in this in these two shorts. Go and, for it. Uh, uh, dude, like, so Shane and I, uh, 2000, oh, man, 2002, I want to say it was, we started talking about it, and we were trying to figure out how to do it. We, in 2002... Uh, Celebration 2 was here in Indy yep. uh, for Star Wars. It's the Star Wars convention. And they had a contest. Mm-hmm. And then we were trying to figure out how we could be in the next contest because they had already announced that Celebration 3 was supposed to happen here mm-hmm. in Indianapolis as well. So we were trying to figure out how to be a part of that fan film's contest. Yep. Uh, so... Uh, our original story idea was that there was going to be somebody who was very Mandalorian-esque. You didn't know if he was or not, if I remember correctly. Uh, but he did uh, he did General Grievous's thing before General Grievous did it because we were we actually started plotting this in 01, I want to yeah. say. Um, and he and this Mandalorian person, which is awesome that now they have the Mandalorian television show, but. I want to say he was a bounty hunter. I, I he was a he, bounty hunter. I don't think he was a Mandalorian. I, I, I we were going to make him look like Boba Fett. I looked up a species that was like an eight or nine foot tall species in the Star Wars okay. universe because I wanted him to be very tall, but I think he was like a hairy creature. Whatever the case. I'd have to go back and, and relook at my notes from it. He would have a uh, belt that had like multiple lightsabers on it because he had the, his trophies from killing Jedi. Yep. Um, so uh, this was before Order 66 was yeah. ever explained as to how the Jedi disappeared. Um, so, uh, but yeah, so we have two different films of me and Shane fighting with lightsabers. Yep. Um, and I feel bad for Shane 
because when he decided to do this, he went through editing, and they have lots of creative ways to do it nowadays. Yeah. But back then, he had to go frame by frame and literally color the lightsabers that and he made. And then adding the glow effect. Yeah, adding the glow effect to the wooden dowels that were used mm -hmm. to fight between me and Shane. And uh, I had a lot of fun being silly with Shane with those. Uh, he went so far crazy with one of them that it's got the um, Duel of the Fates soundtrack mm -hmm. to it. And um, That one's yeah. a good like two and a half minute scene and I want to say... that long? I think it's like two and a half minutes long. Maybe it's two minutes long, but I just... No, I think, I'm sorry. I think it's like a minute and a half. It's a minute and a half that ended up taking me like 80 hours of editing going frame by frame. Yeah, dude, like that was insane. But it looks awesome. I love it. I love showing it to my kids. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's funny to watch it, um, working at a movie theater. It's funny because sometimes I'll show it to employees <laughs> if it comes up in conversation for whatever reason. I'm like, oh, I've got it on my phone. Boop. And I'm like, you need to watch this. And they'd yeah. be like, ha ha, it's Shane and Jason and they're fighting with lightsabers. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, it's funny. It's great. Uh, you know, who who from my generation, us, our generation, no. being born in 1980 or roundabout, who wouldn't want to play with a lightsaber on film? Dude, it was a blast, and it was a lot of fun preparing for like wanting to do that movie. Like, probably would have ended up being like a 30 minute short film. It was literally just going to involve this. It was probably going to be lots of walking. Yeah. <laughs> This creature was going to be hunting down another Jedi, and like you said, he was going to have a bunch of, like, broken and destroyed lightsabers that he just carried around with him. Um, I, I know he was going to have a gun or something, but I think it was going to be one of those things where, like, you didn't realize that when it got to the final fight that he was actually going to break out a lightsaber... Like, he was probably going to be using his gun. I thought it was going to be something like he grabbed the lightsaber pieces and, like, slapped them together. And then was like, and then they made, they were, they worked. Uh, I thought that was, if, I, I don't know. It's been 12 it's years, been 15, 16 lot, yeah. years. Yeah. So. I'm sure we had a lot of ideas going on at that time. But That's true. It was, uh, and we never even got to the, like, script writing process. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, it was just fun to to have those ideas but even though we didn't do that we made some badass stuff excuse me badass stuff instead your first writing and directing movie by yourself was next oh yeah but i mean uh, we made to change the world um the whole premise was which gets us in a lot of trouble on youtube <laughs> <laughs> we've had we've had a couple of videos banned because uh, because of this movie. Uh, so the whole premise of it was it's kind of like the whole like um, they bring it up in Endgame, right? Yeah. They bring it up in Endgame where they're like, so why can't we just go back and find baby Thanos and kill him? Uh, so years ago, I had the idea of what if you went back and killed Hitler before he was Hitler, um, caused that never to happen. And so what, but my, ref, my idea on that was the fact that I wanted to make it not to praise Hitler, but to point out that it could be worse. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Um, so the whole premise of the movie is uh, you have a guy whose family is tragically taken away from him uh, by neo-Nazis. Neo uh, group and so he decides instead of that he's going to go eliminate who made the Nazis so popular so he goes back in time and he ends up he has this time tra traveling ability he goes back in time kills Hitler as a teenager uh, mm -hmm. and then and then comes back and finds out like the whole like, teenage Hitler played by the amazing Drew Stafford <laughs> yes Drew Stafford also known as Luke Skywalker if you went to uh, if you ever go to Disney World yep. um, but yeah so Drew played a young Hitler we killed him and then uh, when the guy comes back to the few, uh, current time uh, while most of the stuff is kind of normal because his brother and his sister-in-law are no longer dead you know. things are uh, things are quite different um the world's so, a much darker place it's much like if darker Biff Tannen ran the world and then <laughs> if Biff Tannen ran the world uh but yeah so uh i hope to at some point soon maybe get that up on our youtube channel because that's something that's another one that i i, I know uh, 
big surprise. Jason wrote and directed it, and he loves it. So, uh, well, and I think yeah. we did uh, we did a few special effects in it that were that were new for us. Yeah, um, kind of kind of stepped up our game a little bit with this one. Um, it it was it was a lot of fun to work on. We had a great cast for it. Yeah, this was probably at our peak. Yep. Uh, as far as our uh, our influence in the area, so. A, a lot of people knew who we were. A yep. lot of people were willing to work with us. Um, I had certain people in mind when I wrote the movie, so we got those people for the most of the roles that I wanted them to be in. Uh, Shane found uh, to round out the rest of the characters and stuff. He his dad was involved, who built a crane, mm -hmm. uh, um, and then he also built a dolly system mm -hmm. and. Um, or a track system, sorry. Track he, system. he built the track, but he also he built also the built the, uh, the steady cam that we used for when Lee runs out of his out of his car up to the front door. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He yep. built the steady cam that we ended up using yeah. for that. Yeah. So like his, your dad was very heavily involved, yep. which we were very thankful for that. Um, so we got we got to we stepped up our game with this movie, and it started. Uh, I won't I'll, I won't lie. This is when it started to get even more. Uh, work like compared to just having fun. Correct. I'll, um, I'll definitely agree with you on uh, that. Trying to keep up with our, uh, trying to keep up with the per the persona that we were creating already, and then on top of that, like making sure we were making good quality films, but also stepping it up. Which you know, it's not always the worst thing uh, when you're trying to outdo yourself and trying to be better. It's just once it started getting to this point, we started feeling. I think. In my personal opinion, I started feeling a little bit more pressure, and like of we need this to be good, compared to where w the reason I say consternate is always my favorite is because there was no pressure. No. There was literally just us being silly with cameras and all of our friends who wanted to be involved with it, and it, it, it and it turns out it's not a great film by any means, but it it turned out to be something that. I love and enjoy because of the fact that it's our friends, our family. We had fun with it. Um, whereas, like like I said, everything else after this point just starts getting a little bit more pressure and a little bit more work related. And it was like, oh, we've got to keep up. Like we were trying to do this for fun and enjoy it. And then, and and I won't even. Uh, and Shane was doing a great job of trying to make sure that we had our finger on the pulse of Indianapolis filmmaking because of the fact that he didn't want us to lose our momentum. Um, but uh, it all, like I said, it just started, it felt like it was starting to take a toll on all aspects of life. So. 2003 was probably the height of a lot of healthy competition. Yeah. A lot of the other guys that I had mentioned earlier in the show were starting to up their games. Cause like, uh, so Bunk Film's first film was a spoof on the Blair Witch Project called the Bunk Witch Project. Yep. I put that in the same category as Consternate. They were trying Absolutely. to spoof Bunk or uh, the Blair Witch Project. We were trying to to do uh, you know Scream. Like I, I put those kind of in the same category. And then over the years, you know, we would release something like Escape, and then we'd have a showing of it somewhere around town. A couple of those guys and some of the other guys would come, and they'd see, it and they'd be like, "Oh wow!" Like. You guys have definitely improved because, you know, we invited those guys to the Consternate premiere. So, we, have, you know, we knew them back then. Two or three years later, they come and watch Escape and they're like, oh, we can definitely see you guys have improved in these areas, you know, but maybe your audio, your, you know, you need to up your microphone game or something. So then it's like, all right, well, now I need to start investing some money in microphones. Um, and then we would go watch their stuff because... Um, at that point, there was a, a theater in town on the south side, um, Ron Keaty's uh, Keystone Theater, that south, would south, south Keystone. Keystone Theater, and they would once a month let any independent filmmaker that had a project to show show it for free. You could literally just take him a, a DVD. Uh, he he called it his filmmakers' night or whatever, and you know anybody that wanted to show anything could you know do their own self promotion. I went to you know eight or nine of them over the years. Uh, anytime I had the night off to go, so I would be watching products from other people. Uh, I've gone to like the the Raxo Films. I went to a certain Justice's premiere that they had at uh, the IMAX theater downtown. Um, I'm not we sure. We went to the one at the Historical Society once too. 
That was like filmed at like James Dean's uh, hometown or oh, something. Oh, yes. Was I cannot it, remember the name of that Wasn't that Chris? Movie. That was Chris also. That was his second film. And I am drawing a blank on the name of that movie. But I think that movie is also the first time I saw Don Becker, if I remember correctly. I want to say that's the one where, like, I don't know, eh, whatever the case Yeah, I can't remember the name of that movie. Um, I still have the program for it uh, in all my filmmaking boxes at home, but uh, I should look into that and figure it out. Maybe make it go up on screen right now. (laughs) Okay. Uh, But anyway, so... uh, there was a lot of healthy competition going on at that point where a lot of us that were, were involved with filmmaking would go to each other's stuff and we would critique or give advice to each other and, and stuff like that. But at the same time, and, and I know this is true for a couple of these other guys, as much as we supported each other, we still just wanted to be better than everybody else. Oh, absolutely. We still wanted to be like, yeah, but you guys aren't as good as us yet. And so I, I am fully aware, looking back, that I definitely took our filmmaking stuff far more seriously than anybody else did. Um, I, it probably is part of what took a huge toll on my first marriage. Like, I, I definitely overdevoted myself to making sure that we always made movies and that I was always, you know, at filming and at filming locations no matter what the thing was like whether I was just the producer or I was the writer director like I just felt that I always had to be there to make sure that everything was gonna go smooth or whatnot and so yeah it was it was healthy competition but I know that I took it a little too seriously and I pushed you and Zach and and later in in time Chris as far as I could push you before I got pushed back where you guys were just like we don't have time for this. Like, this is too much of a time commitment. Um, right after To Change the World, we ended up doing... Uh, we, had, we had made friends with a band. Uh, the band was a, a duo that played at the bar that we were regulars at, Unpainted Huff Hines. It was just two guys that did... Covers, uh, for the most part. Covers, for the most part, but a couple of their own songs that were just really silly and ridiculous. Yeah. Um, like... Uh, Jack Black's band, uh, Tenacious, Tenacious D. D. Like they were like Tenacious D type. Tenacious D time. Yeah, like they just they they had silly and goofy songs. Um, I didn't even write that. Take your shoes off was the name of the of the video that we shot. So much fun. It shot was it so at, silly. Yeah, we shot it at the house that they lived at at that time. Uh, we just kind of sat down and came up with a story about how it's one guy who wants to impress a girl, so he ends up having a party, but everybody that comes over to the party, they have to take their shoes off at the front door, and then it's literally just like uh, the two of them playing music in the living room, and everybody's just dancing around the house. Oh my goodness, and and I, we filmed it all, most of it, all the party sequences, we filmed it all in one night. Yep. And it was so silly and funny. And we shot till like five o'clock in the morning. We shot from like nine till night. I don't remember. Do we shot all night? I I I remember like, um, is it Dan? We did. We did. Chris and Dan. Chris and Dan. So Dan's girlfriend or wife, one or the other, had to work the next morning, and she started yelling at her, at Dan, and kicked us out. And I want to say that was around midnight or past midnight. I don't remember us filming that late in the morning, but I won't. I, I, you might be right. Well, so I remember but it's it's a fun video. You should I remember us shooting all the large cast stuff at the beginning, but then I feel like all of the there oh, was maybe, some other stuff. Yeah, there was just a couple was, of us. The, it was Chris and um, the girl. Brandy. No, it wasn't no. Brandy. What the other? It was the other waitress from the from P.S. O'Rourke. Genie. Yes, Jeannie, that was yeah. her name. Uh, so it was Chris and Jeannie. You might have filmed with them after we left. Maybe. All I can tell okay. you is we definitely pissed off Dan's wife so bad that I want to say around, like, we, we were like, she said something like, you only have half an hour left or something like that. And so that's when we filmed the exit sequence. Everybody running out of the house. And everybody's running out of this house and, and, and silliness ensues. Yeah. But... Um, this was the first night that I ever met. Uh, I came over to help with filming and uh, be an extra or be a party member, or whatever. Mm-hmm. As the first night I met Micah Scott and Tony oh, yeah. Smith, <laughs> and <laughs> the guys who ended up becoming and we rebuilt. ended up becoming uh, really good friends and mm-hmm. enjoying each other's company. And I mean, that's a totally different story for another time. But like, yeah. Um, so Tony, Micah, and Chris. Once Dan moved, I think. 
uh, all came a part of a group named Rebuilt. And, uh, and uh, we had a lot of fun, me and Shane and a lot of our other friends yeah. had a lot of fun hanging out with uh, Rebuilt's crew and going and supporting them when they were on the music scene here in Indianapolis. I really wish we would have shot a music video for them because they had a lot of songs that I had a lot of ideas for music videos oh, and, for. And, and they, they had such characters. Yeah, oh yeah, for and sure. All, all of them. All five of those guys were hilarious. Yeah. And, and so, so I really much regret fun. never getting. I, I know it was talked about a lot, and especially once Chris joined Gemini Films. Yeah. It was definitely talked about doing music videos for the band, and I just, I'm not really sure why it never happened. I feel like we should convince them to go do it now. <laughs> that would um, be fun. After that music video, and well, the music video is cool, and I. I actually can watch the music video and might be able to put it up. I can put it up on the website because I have Chris's interview that he did on IMC where oh, he yeah. showed that music video. It's the Indie Music Channel, which no longer exists, but yeah. it was uh, an outlet for independent film and independent music here yep. in Indianapolis. Uh, we, we went on there a total of three times. Uh, Chris went on there with the Unpainted Huff Heinz music video, and I have a digital copy of his interview so I can rip the the music video from that. I went on there for Reunion, and then Joshua Ramsey went on for something else. I have his interview also, and I need to I need to watch it. I can't remember what he went on there to discuss. That's interesting. But yeah, Ramsey went on there. Ramsey may have just been going on there to discuss himself, and he talked about Reunion. Maybe that's what... Okay, that would make more sense. Um, Why would he talk about Reunion? Was he even in Reunion? Yeah, he was the lawyer in Reunion. Oh, yeah. I forgot that he was in that. Yeah. Uh, so after the music video, um, we I did another film project for school. It was called uh, The Night Stalker. The assignment was to, um, to show how dying film in silent films uh, was used to affect... Uh, like mood, like uh, if it was a if it was a nighttime scene, they would dye the film blue so that it had a blue hue to it. If it was supposed to be like super bright and sunny, they'd dye it like red. Um, it was it was a project that I did to show how different color tones and temperatures were used in silent film. Jason played a cop. My ex-wife played his his wife, uh, and it it it's complete with corny uh 1920s music and it has uh title cards for the dialogue between scenes so i i, I liked it i'm proud of it but it's it's kind of cheesy i used the um uh effect in in adobe that makes it look like it's old grainy and has like you know uh streaks and stuff in it and so that was a that was a project for school that i did uh it was like five minutes long at the most maybe and then what's up just found it on chris spurgeon's uh youtube channel okay uh he has just unpainted how fine to take your shoes off oh cool well yeah, it's not even the imc all right well i will have to watch that or i talk will to share him it with you right now or talk to him about putting it on our website yeah. um then we get to 2004 and the next feature length film that we did uh so it took about it took four years of us doing shorts and I mean, like, some of our shorts are, like, 45-minute shorts. I think yeah. both um, To Change the World and um, Escape. Escape are about 45 minutes long. Uh, in 2004, I finally wrote and directed a feature-length film, and it is our first PG-13 film that we did. Basically, everything else that we had done could basically would be rated R. Cause and we, why did you do that? I did it for my dad. My dad had Aww. spent so many years helping us with all of our projects and with everything that we had done um and i just was my, my parents are very a very anti-profanity very anti-sex very you know religious people so they were really never interested in this i mean they were interested in our stuff but like i kept telling them you're not really going to be interested in it. There's, there's language in it that you don't like or you know there's sex in it that you're not gonna like like I, I, I never made a film that I felt... Pr I, I mean, I was proud of all of our stuff that we did, but not, not proud to show it to my parents because I knew that I would be judged by them for, oh, my God, this is what our son is doing. He's making these movies. Uh, but my dad, no Love matter you, what... Larry and Marsha. Yeah. Um, 
And I mean, from, from consternate on, my parents were supportive. They let us film in their house for multiple movies. My dad, like you said, he built us a, a dolly track system. He built us a crane. He built us a steady cam. Like, he, he built us all kinds of stuff to save us money. And so, like, and growing up, my dad and I really didn't get along. Um, uh, he's military. I was stubborn and a jackass. And so we got in a lot of fights and didn't get along, and I, I didn't like my dad for a long time. Um, so I just kind of hit a point in life where, like, I realized that my dad always had my back, and so I kind of just turned that into a movie. Um, and it's a nonlinear film. What? <laughs> um, it, it, it deals with our main character, played by Chris Spurgeon, the Unpainted Huffines rebuilt uh, lead singer. Um, he plays my main character whose father passes away in the movie um, but when his father passes away he, and he comes back for the funeral um, he's been kind of a drifter uh, I, I was very much in my pool hall junkies phase of, phase of life right here yeah you were yeah I was um, so he was a pool hustler that was just going around the entire country making money where he could living the free life hustling hustling um always doing it because he was so angry at his father and anytime he did come home uh his father you know blew him a bunch of crap told him that he only was there for the money you know oh you're you know you're showing up you what do you what do you need now a thousand dollars like his dad was very like negative towards his lifestyle and it's because his dad just wanted him to you know be a good normal person grow up and grow up and you know the main character much like myself was very Peter Pan syndrome and wanted to do whatever he wanted to do because he just wanted to have fun with life and didn't want responsibility and he was really good at playing pool so he went and made money playing pool um, he comes home for his father's funeral and again a lot of this story is told in flashbacks you get to see like the fights that, that they had and uh, it, it actually flashes back even to children Don Becker plays dead Don Becker uh, plays the father who this was the first time that we worked with him and I guess the only time we've ever nope, actually nope. worked with we him. We also worked with No One li uh, No One Dies. Oh, No One Dies. You're right. Yeah, yeah good call. Uh, but uh, got to meet Don Becker and the greatest part about Don Becker uh, playing the dad in this is he wanted to be around whether he was filming or not. So he would ask me for for you know our filming schedule and if it would be okay for him to just show up and he ended up you know holding the microphone for us he ended up running a camera for us one day like he just he is such a great guy that just wants to be a part of making films He's that he awesome. just would show up and and literally offer to do anything we needed help with yeah. like and, and i mean He's an actor, and he he's uh, he's good at the roles that I've seen him in, but just knowing his attitude about wanting to always be there and help is really awesome. Makes him a, a, a top-notch stellar dude, in my opinion. Um, but it, it also it, it, it jumps back to high school, and it also jumps back to childhood, because at the funeral, our main character gets uh, reunited with his like best friend growing up. That's a guy and a girl. They were best friends growing up. And kind of the the plot of the whole movie is the fact that they were n they were perfect for each other, but they were never single at the same time, so it never worked out. Um, it was kind of one of those like you know ships passing in the night type thing where like they just <coughs> anytime he kind of looked at her differently. She had a boyfriend, or anytime where she was like, oh, I might be interested in him. He you know was like leaving town or whatnot, so it just never worked out for him. Um, but they get together that night and start drinking and start just talking about growing up. And so that's when we get lots of flashbacks to high school and then even farther flashbacks to them growing up together. Um, we had a couple of really awesome kids that even when I watch this movie now, like I'm knocked away at some of the stuff that these kids did, like the scene where they drink the vodka together, which was literally like them drinking water out of a, you know, empty vodka bottle. Uh, but like their re the, the reactions that we were able to get from them when we were like, okay, this is this is water, but when you taste it, I want it to taste really bad. And uh, Anthony, the the kid, we had him do spit takes, and they were just perfect. Like he was so he he had so much personality for like a ten year old kid. Um, but we had a really great cast. I wrote a hundred and forty page script. I want to say. Ended up being right around two, an hour and 48 minutes, I want to think, is the runtime on it. Um, 
probably the thing that I'm most proud of. While I am super proud of Consternate and what we did with that, like, I feel that production-wise, this was was near the height of, of oh, where absolutely. we were. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it, it, there's a couple of, of things that are messed up. There's day-for-night shots that, you know, going back and forth between the one and two takes, you can see, oh, it's really bright and sunny outside. Oh, it is not so bright and sunny anymore outside. And, you know, there were things like that. that they do that in Hollywood. <laughs> and that we could have done better, but, like, you know, we 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 had stepped up a microphone game. We had two, we had two microphone like um, you know omnidirectional microphones that we were that we were using that I think made our audio ten times better than any of the audio we'd done oh, before. Yeah. Um, we uh, we had Chris Starr in the movie, and because of his music connections, we were able to get a couple of bands from town to use their original music in the movie. Yep. Um, uh, the opening scene has a has a music uh, track from a band called Heaven and Hell. Um, I almost want to say that the song is called One Day. I think, um, but it's, yeah, I think you're right. It's just a really awesome song for this montage opening credits that that we do. I feel like you know, I, I tooting my own horn. I feel like I stepped it up for those opening and closing credits. Um, uh, the closing credits where. It shows the scene, yeah, yeah. and then it wipes to black and white when their name pops up. Like, I don't know. I just, it, I am very proud of what we pulled off with Reunion. I think we had great cast, great acting. I didn't piss off a bunch of people like I did on Consternate, where we had to go into panic mode. Um, Whatever. It got done. Yeah, the production went super well, in my opinion. We we did some really crazy, like, I mean, we drove up to Chicago for one day to film a ton of stuff uh, at Navy Pier and then just running around the city of Chicago uh, having Chris get on and off the L at different places so that I could so that I could get video footage of it um, we would literally like Chris and I would jump off go to a, like an L station shoot him like walking in we'd shoot him waiting for a train we'd get on the train I'd shoot him on the train we'd go like three or four stops and like we'd, we'd when we jumped out of the car, we'd say, we're going to go three stops. And then, you know, you guys go down three stops or whatever. And that was, that was a lot of fun making that gorilla filmmaking stuff happen. But I'm, I'm really proud of reunion. I, again, I made it for my dad. I'm really happy that, uh, he was able to watch it and that he enjoyed it. Um, and we've now talked about all three of our films that we did at an afternoon and an evening with Jim and I films. Yes. We organized uh, an event at IUPUI. I, it wasn't, it wasn't even like, didn't it kind of like come out of nowhere, right? Like, oh wait, no, no, no. We were showing it for Zach. Yes, that it was. We it were, was. Yeah, it was one of Zach's connections. We were. I want to say it was because it was his senior year, and he was trying to show his the yeah. Chrome Lady because he had done so much work on it. Yep. And we were like, oh, we can. Is it okay to do this? And so we ended up doing the afternoon was all planned, yep. and then the film people at IUPUI, the IUPUI Film Club. Mm -hmm came to Shane and said what can you do an evening the same night and then they like got I want to say they had like some kind of like reception stuff like popcorn or something and yeah. drinks or something the, like uh, the film club at IUPUI had to uh, had use to like host money. events yeah. or like, yeah, use, use their financial resources to like host events so when they found out that we were doing the afternoon thing as a as a project for Zach and his his film department stuff, they like you said they were like, "Can can you sh just show everything again in the evening and we'll we'll they uh, market it, it for us and yeah. promote it for you and we'll get a, you know we'll get all the people in the we film almost department. backed out of the afternoon, but there were certain things that we had to do in the afternoon. Yep, because we liked the idea of the evening better and we didn't we were we wanted mm -hmm. everybody to go to the evening more so. I, yeah. And our afternoon was definitely like what, like a fourth or a fifth of the yeah. attendees that the evening was. Yeah. The evening went so well. Speaking of which, honey, I absolutely love you. This was the first time that Shane even thought there was a possibility of me and you ending up together <laughs> because of the fact that you showed up to that. And uh, we barely, uh, he barely knew I you. I barely knew her. And, uh, but uh, it was one of those moments of like, he was like, dude, I think she's interested in you. And I was like, whatever. No, like that's, she's got a guy. Don't worry about <laughs> it. Uh, but yeah, hey, I, I love you. 
I um, called it back then. You did. You you absolutely did. Uh, but yeah, so that was an awesome day. I, I've actually got a really nice picture that I'll try to remember to put up right here uh, of you, me, and Zach <laughs> at the end of that day where we literally all three look exhausted. Because I want to say the afternoon stuff started at like 2.30 and then the evening stuff was at like 7. Yeah, it, it was like, a three hour. It was, I mean, with the three movies, it's yep. three hours. And we put in a little bit of break time. But mm -hmm. yeah, we hustled from one side of the campus to the other. Yeah. Oh, that's right. They were at two different places. Yeah, yeah. the first one was in that like middle auditorium. It was where we took our film class at the, yes. nurse, the, at nursing the nurse's building. building. Yeah. And then, and the, then the other the one was in the auditorium. was in the actual auditorium. On the basement, basement of the library? Yeah, either the library or the media center. Or the media, yeah, one of those two. It was in the basement of that building. Much nicer location, but yeah, we had... And that was one... I can't... Obviously, I can't remember off the top of my head now, but there was probably like 10 or 15 people that showed up to that that like I had no idea were going to be there. Oh, yeah, Like yeah, Just yeah. like high school friends or like other college friends yep. that had you know either heard about it through the marketing at IUPY or whatever, where I was just like, oh... What are you doing here? Like, I had no idea you were going to be here. Like, it was really cool to see how many people showed up to that evening one. Yeah, that was that was a fun time. So, um, so after I did reunion, our last two project uh, reunion was the last official thing that we finished and released to the public. Absolutely. Um, had we ever released your next movie, it probably would have eclipsed reunion for production value. Oh, wow. I really believe that what you and Zach did with this next movie looks and and sounds better than Reunion. And I and I, like I said, I'm really high on Reunion, but I think you guys stepped it up again for this movie. Talk uh, about it. Um, yeah, so at that point in time, uh, in between relationships, we were, I was... Um, uh, what year is this? 2005 we, is when we, we filmed it? We filmed it in 2005. Yep, fall oh, of 2005. Wow, so, man, uh, Love Hurts. So the first time that ever really hurt me, uh, yeah, I didn't get over it very easily. It took me a while. So uh, Crazy About You was definitely a therapeutic yes. thing to do. Uh, so I wrote, uh, a lot of people tell me that if you know it, the f musical The Last Five Years oh, yeah. uh, is um, done by Jason Robert Brown, movie with uh, Jeremy Jordan and Anna, Anna Kendrick. Kendrick. Uh, a lot of people tell me who have gone through divorces that it's a very therapeutic thing to watch and oh, yes. uh, experience that show. Um, you literally gave me the CD when I went through my first divorce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you needed that CD. I definitely needed that um, CD. But so uh, this was my ode to heartbreak. Um, mm -hmm. I was in watching a lot of High Fidelity, uh, John Cusack movies at the mm -hmm. time. I um, broken hearted, crushing on a girl who was in a long, really long term relationship at the point in time. Uh, so like the main character in this film is like or the main girl in this movie is kind of a mashup of like three or four different women that I know of mm -hmm. uh, that uh, what for whatever reason I was either entangled with or not entangled with but thought wanted to be entangled with whatever you want to call it. Um, so yeah, she's this mashup of multiple girls. Um, my guy is very much me. Uh, I wrote directed you well did i'm not sorry direct it. thank you i wrote produced and starred in it we had zach direct it because i i thought zach had done so much for us mm -hmm. at this point in time and he had never directed anything he had been running things behind the camera for so mm -hmm. long but his his knowledge of what we were doing his his eye for things had grown so much while we were and and granted like all of us did and I don't think he was ever behind us. I don't want it to sound that way. No. Um, but I felt like he had definitely, he probably even surpassed us as far as like his ability to see things while he was making the movie from a technical aspect. Oh yeah. Uh, and a lot of it probably had to do with the schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, I, I approached him and said I wanted him to direct it because I wanted him, I wanted to focus since this was such a personal movie to me, I wanted to focus on if I was going to star in this film, which I made them, I made him audition me 
because I did not want to just get it because I wrote it. I wanted to get it because I deserved it, uh, which probably didn't matter anyway. He probably was <laughs> going to give it to me anyways. But the fact remains that I, um, if we could have found somebody to play that character better, I would have wanted it. Um, and Matt Gibson was awesome when he came and, and auditioned for us. I loved it. And we loved him so much when he auditioned for this movie that we didn't give him the lead role. But we purposely wrote in an entire character yep. for him that we just literally did. He was never in the script before Matt Gibson auditioned. But because of Matt, I saw an avenue to uh, add another character that would add another layer to the entire film. So. My still absolute favorite scene, both on paper and, and that you guys filmed for this movie, is the scene that has Matt Gibson. Your brother came back as Larry McKenzie. Oh, yeah. Chris Spurgeon came back as uh, Callahan, uh, Johnny, Cal Johnny Callahan, and who, you were the fourth person in that scene. Yeah. We brought back two characters from previous movies to put into this film, and I just absolutely loved it because your brother survived consternate, and then for whatever reason, Chris Spurgeon, uh, uh, Johnny Callahan, happened to be in town for this like cookout that we had. Like, I just, I love that scene between the four of those guys. And it's awesome. Like, in, in one of the things that we've done, that we did with these movies that we haven't mentioned yet oh, was Nicole, yeah. we we totally created our A View Askew universe. Yep. Like, we told, like, everything, all of our movies are, take place in our fictional city. Yep. We never gave it a name. Yep. But O'Rourke's was always the same and, bar. Was yep. the same bar that every, it was like the hole in the wall or the the bar in the town mm -hmm. that everybody went to, um, and so uh, a lot of characters, kind of like with Kevin Smith movies, yep, uh, like brothers and sisters of characters would pop up in other movies, and if you knew our movies well enough sure you would pick it up but if you didn't it was no big deal you didn't feel left out no. especially like the one you were just talking about the cookout sequence yeah. in this movie it's you, just four dudes would, at a cookout yeah it's four dudes at a cookout you would never know unless you watched the other ones and remembered them yep and then you'd be like holy shit it's larry McKenzie. it's larry mckenzie from consternate oh, that's dude. awesome and and yeah um but yeah so my brother uh my brother played uh, Shane's brother in Consternate, and yep. then he also played a character that same character in this movie. Um, and we got we this was another one, I think you're right. We stepped up the production value m immensely. Um, there's only like one or two things that I would really change looking sure. back on it. Um, I wish we could have, I wish we would have, um, I wish we would have finished it, obviously, and which we could technically still do. We could, but we filmed one sequence twice because the first time we lost the tape and then we lost the tape the second time mm -hmm. and it sucks because yep. that's what we wanted we feel like it's necessary but in all actuality we could probably cut it out we, um, I mean I, I, I kind of want to finish this movie even now it would be fun to like just get it edited put uh, one of our other main characters is Justin Browning um or J.J. Browning, if you're in the music uh, industry in the area. Um, uh, so he uh, he plays one of the lead roles, and he's been a friend of ours for decades, and he was in a bunch of other movies. Oh, yeah. uh, so, But he recently just made a comment about it not being done, and I was like, yeah. well, <laughs> we could still finish it. Uh, and if we do, we got to figure out how to get s music, because... Yeah. And then he was like, ahem, ahem, because <laughs> well, he is very still in tune with the indie music scene. The, so. the crappy part about the post-production on this was that I gave too much leeway to Zach. I think Zach had all of the tapes and the footage for at least a year yeah, before I was set, like... I, I got I got extremely frustrated with him because he just wasn't he wasn't editing the movie he wasn't getting it done and I mean I understand he was he was in a relationship but he'd been in that relationship for a couple of years he it's who he ended up marrying but I just I, I, and, hi I mean, Benny <laughs> he had he had he he should have been done with schooling at that point I, and I don't know he was. 
what exactly was going on necessarily with him in life or anything, but I remember getting very upset and frustrated with him over the course of the year that he wasn't even, like, offering to show me scenes that he'd cut or asking me to come over to see scenes or, like, just he showed no progress to me that he was actually getting post-production done and after a year it literally got to the point where I said dude you need to give me all of the footage you need to give me all the tapes I I will make this happen because again and I understand it's part of my narcissistic personality I just wanted I wanted to get it done I wanted to be able to put it out I was divorced at this point yes okay so you and 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 not that not that I want to minimize what was going on in your life but you didn't have a significant other at this point I had a lot more free time. time. Yep. I had just moved to Massachusetts. Yep. Uh, I know, let me rephrase that. I know I moved to Massachusetts by the time you took the footage. Yes. Because that was, I moved a year after we finished filming. Uh, Yeah, well, we filmed in the fall of 05 and you moved in May of 06. Yeah. So you moved like six months afterwards. And, okay, maybe Zach only had the footage for like six or eight months or something, but maybe it wasn't a full year, but it got to the point where I was so frustrated that he was not making process or progress on the post-production that I forced him to give me the footage. Um, We have a great... You did a first cut of the movie. Right. Um... With, I, with, we with the one, it. With, uh, I did the first. I did that first cut. While, uh, so he had logged some of the tapes. Uh, so I finished logging tapes and importing the good takes. I put together the rough cut, and then that is the point when I was putting together that rough cut that we learned that one scene was still missing. Uh, I tried, which to, is weird because I, I know that we recognized the fact that it was missing the first time. Yeah. It was only the second time when we were doing the that you were doing the rough cut that yeah. you realized we were missing it the second time. The second time, time yes. Um, still don't know how that happened. Still have no idea where those tapes went. Zach did recently admit that, uh, and I honestly didn't even know about this until he admitted it to us a couple of months ago, that he was doing other film projects on the side down with other people in Greenwood. Yep. And he admitted that potentially... They could have crossed. They could have crossed. He could have had all tapes. of our tapes in a bag when he went to go help them film, and then he accidentally gave them, you know, one a of bag, our tapes. A tape or, or something, yep. You know, it, it, you know, shit happens, you know, 20 years ago. It's it, We can't change it now, but... Excuse me, only 15 years ago. Oh, good call, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, But so it's one of those disappointing things that one of... I feel... And, and at that time, I was deflated and demoralized because of the fact we were missing this scene that I as the producer thought was the the most important scene in the film um, I really feel like for your character it's it's you explaining your motivations and attempting to attempting to sh- I don't even know how to explain it right uh, the the person that you're interested in, who you have decided that you are going to treat poorly, it, it, it's your rekindling your friendship with them through that oh, conversation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I feel like it's really important because without that scene, there's really not a, like, it just goes from, oh, he's being a dick to her to, like, all of a sudden she's showing up at a dinner party and everything's okay again. Like, well, Yeah, but if you think of we can talk about this off, yeah, uh, I just, after this. I, I don't want to keep you guys <laughs> waiting anymore. Just at, at that time, as the producer, I felt that that scene was too monumental to the overall story that the movie wouldn't work without it. And I know I made that very clear at that point that I was that upset about it. Uh, and you did do the rough cut, and then I got a hold of that rough cut, and I made uh, some tweaks to it. And I got through the first half of the movie, I think, to like shave some stuff off take a couple of different angles something along those lines Mm -hmm. uh, because we were all working off the same hard drive so then after that I remember I cut the trailer together yeah the trailer's phenomenal and I released the trailer on YouTube which Mm -hmm. you can see that on our website yep so it's on Jason's website and then I ripped it and took it and put it over on our Gemini Films website which we're gonna do to Chris Spurgeon's (laughs) Unpainted Buff Lines it's gonna end up on YouTube for Shane or for Gemini Gemini Films Films. Um, but uh, so released the trailer and I gave all the footage back to Zach and I said you just got to finish this up and I believe he said that he still has that hard drive just chilling at his house inside a film can 
that we that we marked with Gemini Film logos. Um, so we are we're looking at the possibility of maybe getting. I, the the only issue right now is if we import all of the footage starting from scratch, we got to do the entire edit from scratch, uh, which isn't the worst idea, but we all are. Well, Shane and I aren't nearly as busy as no. we normally are because we're not working currently. Uh, but no. uh, we are, uh, the, the possibility is still there. Although I, I don't know if everybody who is in that movie would appreciate that movie being released nowadays. I mean, there, there are some people in that movie that we no longer talk to. There were some people that that was the only thing that they did for us. Um, after reunion and after the screening, so we got to do a reunion. Obviously, that stepped up our cred, our yeah. street cred in the city. We had completed a, a, a feature-length film. Uh, it had a lot of really good reception. Um, we, we, we had a premiere night of it. We had a lot of people show up. Um, I was super happy and proud of it. And that opened the doors for a lot of people that we didn't know as well to audition for Crazy About You, brought in some new blood that we hadn't worked with before. And I remember one of them being very agitated and annoyed that we didn't offer her the the lead role. That that happened, um, and then like she was offended by the fact that yep. we wanted her to play the best friend. Yep. I mean, it which is which was hilarious. It is what it is. Uh, oh, you know what? Crazy about you did another one of those crazy trips that we did when we drove all the way Absolutely. to Baltimore to film stuff. That was fun because we wanted to go. We wanted to shoot at John Hopkins University and yep. make it as realistic as possible. So we drove overnight all the way down to Baltimore. Or no, we didn't yeah. drive overnight. We drove. We, there, we left in the morning. We left in the we morning. Got there, we shot some stuff in the afternoon. Or, we, or we, no, we didn't shoot that day. We spent the night that night. Yeah, we spent the night. We shot the next day. Shot all and day And then drove the next straight day. through. And then that Come was the homing. overnight. Yeah, we didn't get back into town until 2 or 3 in the morning or something super late. Amy, I am so sorry. Yeah, uh, that was that was terrible for Amy, who did the majority of the driving. Yeah, in her van. In her van. I mean, I paid a lot in gas for that trip, but yeah, it was still her vehicle. Oh, my God. The fact that we talk about money like that now, and we're like, we're yeah. like, oh, we spent so much way back then. <laughs> it's like now we'd be like, okay, yeah. a couple hundred bucks so that we can go somewhere and film yeah, outside, I mean, of our, outside of our state, give ourselves some more uh, credibility as filmmakers. Like, well, and it's just, yeah, like looking back, in the moment, I never really realized how much money I was actually putting into a lot of these productions. Oh yeah. But like looking back and starting to Buying add it up, food. it's just like you know, I paid for I paid for meals on that Baltimore trip. I paid for the two or three hotel rooms that we got on the Baltimore yeah, but we trip. We got all that money back. We did. The hotel money, remember? Oh, that's right. We had a fiasco at the hotel, and I did get that money back. Yeah. So yeah, I forgot about that. But like you know, I, I bought I bought dinner one of the nights that we were that we were out. I you know. Uh, I paid for all the gas. McDonald's, don't feel bad for him. No, we went out to that <laughs> decent dinner. Like, I did buy McDonald's <laughs> breakfast I'm just for kidding, us. I'm kidding. But the, we went to like Hard Rock or something. Yeah, we went. We went somewhere. It was on Baltimore Pier or whatever. Yeah. So, but so that was that was that was a good time. It was a 48 hour whirlwind trip down there to shoot stuff, and I think it looks great. It oh, adds man. better it, production it, value. It does. It does add production value, but it's just still one of those things where we're like, why were we so stupid? <laughs> we and of course, you can do that when you're in your 20s, yeah. right? Because here we are. Uh, Shane and I are 40 or about to be 40, mm -hmm. and it's like. I can't ride in my van for like three hours <laughs> and then get out and be okay. I yeah. to, it's like, Ugh. so yeah, like, I don't know. But yeah, man, I would really, I'd like to see that movie finish just because it, it, it had a whole lot of heart. It had a whole lot of good performances by great people that we were friends with at the time. Um, Most importantly, I would like to rewatch it just to, to, just to revisit what, what what I was able to what we were able to cut together for that first rough cut you, just you, just to that relive that and then we can discuss from I'd what love we to have cut it into webisodes that I mean that'd be fine too and do it's, like four or five episodes and yeah. just release it once a week or once a month episodes, or something yeah that'd be a lot of fun too so we can, just look into to, something like that th I think that would be fun so 
the last, the last, last thing we're going to talk about because we have been on this forever. <laughs> uh, sorry about that, folks. The last project that we had, um, which was badass. It badass. It was pretty badass. Uh, aside, aside from one small little incident. Oh yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll we'll get to that. Uh, so I. After you, we got done with Crazy About You and you went off to Boston. No, you were, we filmed this like the same year, dude. Oh, was I editing this while Zach, ooh. That's, what, that's why it took me so long to get on Zach to get the stuff back to me was because I was editing this at the same time. We filmed it almost like You're right, right on top of that. each other. Yeah. Uh, so this was also the fall of 2005. Um, October, November-ish, I think, somewhere in there. Um, I had written a short, like, 30-page, um, kind of like an action version of Alex Cross. It was a hostage. It was the, it was the negotiator. Oh, okay, good call. It was the negotiator. With the twist of Alex Cross. Yeah. Uh, basically, just uh, Joshua Ramsey, who had, uh, I'd gotten to know. He was supposed to be an escape, had to back out. I ended up giving him a small role in Reunion, where he played the lawyer. And then in this, I ended up making him the lead. He was a, a wannabe Alex Cross type character who was a forensic pathologist. He showed up at a hostage situation at a house. Um, Don Becker's in this one. Don Becker is the father that's being held hostage. We had like four kids from Papa, the guy that plays the bad guy. I was going to say Papa was uh, in this. Steve Pyatt. Steve Pyatt is he's, amazing. If you've ever of, met the man, you know how great he is. Uh, dude, he's so much fun to talk to and hang out with. One of the top-notch best dudes I've ever met in this industry. Like him and like just the fact that him and Don Becker are like, in the same two great movie guys yep. to work with. Uh, yeah, Steve Pyatt, uh, nicknamed Papa. He. He is just, he's a biker with tattoos and a long beard and, and a heart of gold. And yeah, and Not a kidding. bunch of earrings. And he is, he looks so scary. And like when we put out the audition stuff for this and he contacted me, I was like, this dude, like I have to give him the role. Like he, I don't, I, I don't <laughs> care. I don't care if he's the biggest dick in the world. Like he looks perfect for this character. Uh, I, I, I have to have him be the bad guy in this you movie. You Tim. Uh, uh, oh. It starts with a C. And then uh, who is the other guy that played uh, like the detective? Jim Doty. Oh, or Jim glasses. Daughtery, yeah. Jim um, Daughtery. Yeah, uh, like. Who is also our firearms expert for that, which was part of the, knowing him through the community was why I wanted to make sure he was a part of this because we were using firearms and he's a firearm safety instructor. So I asked him, do you mind being a part of this? And will you do all of our firearms work for us? And he and was Mark all Buck about Walter it. Mark Buckwalter brought his arsenal. Mark Buckwalter brought a lot of guns for us to and use. Gave you choices. And yep. And him uh, and Justin, Justin played Justin Browning the, played, played like snipers. Sniper and spotter. And spotter, yep. Uh, so basically it was, we. The trailer for this, the trailer for this movie is awesome. Watch the trailer. It's on our channel. It's on our YouTube channel. It steals the music from the Face Off trailer. We stole music from every movie. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween, Scream, Scream face, face Off. off. Yeah. Like, um, so, yeah, I really like the trailer. I, I think the trailer is... The trailer, personally, is probably better than the movie actually was. Shane messed up on one aspect. He messed up one little thing, and it caused a little bit of a hiccup. And then he was convinced that he shouldn't release the film the way it is because of the fact that you can kind of tell that there's a mm, problem with the exterior shots. So, but, so. but, <laughs> I said, boo honky on that. <laughs> he should still release it because if you're not really paying attention, it's no big deal. And even if you are, you'd be like, oh, it's a low budget independent Indianapolis film. I'm just, I, I'll, I'll lay it out there. So we had two <laughs> days of filming. They were supposed to be at a friend of mine's house. Day one happened at my friend's house. We did all of the interior shots for the scene. An interior shot that Still includes- Still love you, Preston. An interior shot that includes Don Becker sitting on a stairwell that goes to, up to the second floor of my friend Preston's house. We scuffed up Preston's kitchen hardwood floor that day of filming. I didn't even know that it had happened. We, one of the scenes involved a gun getting knocked away from one of the characters and it goes like across the floor. I did not realize while we were filming that apparently when it did that, it deeply scratched into his hardwood floor. 
so he we, we had the house from like noon to 8 p.m. that day that he he went off and did whatever let us film for eight hours and then at like 10 30 at night I get a call from Preston and I'm thinking oh we're just going to talk about you know what times that we're going to be filming tomorrow or whatnot he is yelling and screaming at me and telling me that I'm not allowed to film at his house the next day because we we scuffed up his floor and I mean I apologize to him like you know we buried all that you know, a couple of days later, but it, he was justifiably upset at me for scuffing up the, the floor in his house. I was in the wrong. I didn't, I didn't know that it happened until he called me, but I should have known. So we didn't have a house to shoot the exterior scenes at the next day. Um, I can't remember if it was, if, it was um, it was Papa. Papa's house, yeah. I just couldn't remember if I called him that night. I think I might have called him that night after Preston and I got just off the phone just to it. be like, I don't think we're going to be able to film tomorrow. And he literally said, come over to my house. We'll shoot it at my house. We'll use the exterior of my house. So I got everybody that was you know, supposed to be at Preston's. I got them to go from the southeast side to the far west side in Brownsburg. And we ended up filming outside of Papa's house. The problem that Jason is mentioning Papa's house is a one-story house. So the scenes inside that show a stairwell going up to the second floor and the specific shot of Don Becker sitting on those stairs with a gun just didn't work. So here's my thought process. If Shane can spend 80 hours, 80 coloring one <laughs> or two lightsabers you would think that maybe he could take like f maybe 40 hours and then just insert a second story <laughs> onto this house especially with the editing software this man has available to him now <laughs> i think he could pull it off if you think so too comment <laughs> call him text him if you've made it this far in the video i will applaud you anyway uh but yes tell him he's stupid and he should finish his movie and take the time to just even if he just draws it in like a stick figure or something i don't care the, the, well, the second story needs to be there fine and i'll even i'll 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 go a little bit further in this and say that that's not even the only reason i know i know that i you decided. let somebody's influence i showed it I showed it to somebody that I trust in this industry, in the in the independent filmmaking community. I showed it to her, and I got her opinions on it, and her opinions were not very friendly, and and not and not that she was specifically being mean about it. No, she just she was being was being blunt she's a and professional. honest. She, yes, and and we are novice. <laughs> her comments I took to heart. And I just decided And 15 that years later, you should finish your movie. <laughs> uh, if you were missing a scene, I'd give you props and say it's okay <laughs> to ignore it for 15 years. But you're not missing a scene. I'm not. But I have a badass trailer that I cut together that I love. <laughs> I do, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we should just do. We should film hour-long movies and then just cut trailers <laughs> together out of it. The movie. Never release the movie. Just make, just make badass trailers. Uh, that nope. could be a lot of fun. <laughs> so anyway, that is the 19 projects that Jason and I have worked on. Uh, thank you for going down that rabbit hole of nostalgia with us. Uh, yes? No, oh, you, oh, you just said, I got pointing. you. Um, next episode is episode 23. And it's really awesome that it's episode 23. Because this is the 23rd, the 23rd year of Shane Day. Oh, okay. I'll give it to you there. I thought you were going to say because of Michael Jordan and I was going <laughs> to slap you. No, man. The first ever Shane Day was in November of 1997. So we are now I will bow down to that explanation for 23. The 23rd year of Shane have Day. Have you done your work for that one yet? I'm, I'm, I, I have started my preparation okay. for that one. Best Buy is opening at 5 a.m. on Shane Day. I'm not doing I know you're not, but I'm thinking I might go do a remote recording from the Best Buy line and just be like, I'm not even necessarily saying I'm going to go in Best Buy. I'm I mean, stupid, and I might follow you. With 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 COVID the way it is, I mean, I'm not even saying I want to go in Best Buy, <laughs> but I'm just saying. Can we like, just sit in the sit in the car and just <laughs> film them the entire time and be like, look at these dumb we'll motherfuckers. Just, we'll just park in the parking lot across, like in the where the Firestone is or whatever. Yeah, we'll just park over there and we'll we'll have them as our background 
and just talk for a couple of minutes about how we used to wait in these long ass lines at Best Buy also. It'll be interesting to see if there's long lines with COVID. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, uh, they've announced that they're only letting in a limited number of people at a time. So it'll be Absolutely. like when people are coming out, they're gonna let more people in. So that'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm kind of wanting to do it just to see how long the line is. Like you said, like how many people are actually gonna show up. You can buy so much stuff online now. Exactly. I mean, deals, I'm getting stuff from Best Buy already about Black Friday stuff. I already bought some stuff. Nice. So, yeah, so the next episode, episode 23, is uh, going to be, uh, there's like a lot of different ideas going around about Don't what we're going to do. Leave some suspense. But uh, it will be a Shane Day-focused episode that will hopefully release probably later in the day on Shane Day if I go to Best Buy that morning. Uh, but it should hopefully come out on Shane Day. So anyway, thank you guys for listening so far. We will see you next week.